Uh, good afternoon. I'm Corby Kummer, uh, senior editor at The Atlantic and editor here of the Aspen Idea magazine I hope you'll read every word of. You all have issues. And uh, I'm lucky enough to get to talk with um, Margaret Hamburg, whom we'll call Peggy, and uh, Daniel Glickman, whom we'll call Dan for the purposes of this session. Just don't call uh, me Peggy. That's okay. <laughs> uh, about and we've both been called worse. Yeah. <laughs> about food safety. And um, not to read you all of their bios, but as you will be very familiar with, uh, Peggy is the former commissioner of the US uh, Food and Drug Administration, where from 2009 to 2015, just now, she advanced regulatory science and medical product innovation and oversaw many implementation laws related to tobacco and to enhance our subject today, food safety. Uh, she was also at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, um, USHHS under President Clinton, and uh, New York City's pioneering health commissioner in the 1990s, uh, where among many other achievements, which I know, I knew you tuberculosis and HIV at the time, uh, but she also launched the nation's first public health bioterrorism preparedness program. Um, Dan Glickman, who is, uh, the most valuable player at the Aspen, if you ask any of the Aspen colleagues, you'll be seeing today. He's vice president of the Aspen Institute, executive director of its congressional program, and a senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, but the reason we all know him, aside from asking him movie questions from his time as the head of the Motion Picture Association of America, um, is that he was um, at the United States Department of Agriculture, and we're going to be asking him a lot about his um, glorious career there. And Dan not only has done everything and knows the inner workings of Congress and the entire world, explain it to us on an everyday basis, he also reads the newspaper. <laughs> and torn from today's headlines, in an actual paper that you can tear, which I'm very excited by, is a story today headlined, In China's Stomach's Turn at News of Traders Peddling, and I'm not going to tell you what they're peddling to save it for the kicker of the lead. The lead is this. From rat meat masquerading as lamb to tainted milk to exploding watermelons, Chinese consumers have become inured to stomach churning. But on two Countless people were forced to ponder the benefits of vegetarianism uh, after news reports emerged that unscrupulous meat traders had been peddling tons of beef, pork, and chicken wings that in some cases had been frozen for 40 years. So we might all be concerned about our food safety, but um, do we have much to be concerned about? And let's start with the most elementary question that this panel asks. I'm going to get into much more granular detail. Is our food safe? Let's start with Dan and then Peggy. Uh, it's certainly safer than it is in China. Uh, and uh, you know, by and large, our food is safe. Uh, it is, uh, we have a regulatory system that's evolved over the years that could be improved, but uh, it started dealing with meat and poultry as, a, as, as it, Upton Sinclair wrote his book, The Jungle, which was based upon filth and, and meat plants in Chicago during the progressive era, and, and that led to a whole series of laws in, in dealing with the safety of a lot of products, including the Pure Food and Drug Act, which is under the FDA. But, uh, you know, uh, meat, poultry, and related product, products have been very heavily uh, regulated for many, many years, and therefore the United States Department of Agriculture had about, has about 80% of the federal employees that deal with food safety, and yet most of the food is not meat and poultry, it's uh, all the other products, dairy products, it's fruits and vegetables and everything else under the purview of the FDA. And their regulatory system has gotten a lot stronger in recent years, but quite frankly, it was underfunded, under-resourced, and under-regulated for a long time. But, and then the states are heavily involved. In the private sector, most companies, uh, if they have unsafe food, it will put them out of business. So most companies are pretty good at trying to make sure that their food is safe. There are still gaps in the laws. There are still things that fall through the cracks. But by and large, I would have to say that we have very safe food in America. Well, and just to underscore, we do have one of the safest food supplies in the world, uh, but there is still a burden of preventable uh, disease 
that affects Americans every day. I think it's one in six Americans um, suffer from a significant bout of foodborne illness in the course of a year. Importantly, about 7,000 die a year. Um, and huge costs to our healthcare system, of course, because it's preventable illness, to productivity, uh, to the companies that uh, suffer from recalls um, and uh, questions about trust, consumer trust in, in their products. So the overall costs, even in a health, uh, in a food safety system that is quite robust, are high and can be reduced. And I think as the New York Times article also underscores, the landscape for food safety is changing enormously and it requires us as the governmental agencies but also industry uh, to think and act in important new ways because the supply chains are enormously global. And you know we can laugh that the food in China um, is uh, not regulated in the same way and of course we are deeply concerned about the people in China. Um, but we also have to recognize that some of the foods that are being regulated in countries around the world that don't have as robust regulatory systems as we do are bringing food into this country. And you know, we once used to say, don't eat anything if you travel to certain countries unless it's peeled or boiled. Well, you buy that in the safe way now. Um, I want to get to foreign inspection, which is so important to today's regulatory and food landscape, but you mentioned the landscape. Could you describe the landscape that's often very hard for all of us to follow, including me who's been following this for years, between the jurisdictions of the USDA and the FDA, and who inspects what? Um, <clears throat> well, the, the history of uh, the issue of food safety was largely USDA history because it grew out of the filth of the packing plants in Chicago uh, about 100 years ago. So by and large, uh, food safety grew up uh, regulating meat and poultry. And uh, so we have a system that has basically been unchanged, fundamentally unchanged for the last 80 to 100 years, but most of the people in the food safety business inspecting product are at USDA, not at FDA. And in addition to that, the political forces supporting food safety, the Congress specifically, uh, by and large uh, are people on the Agriculture Committee, but they have essentially supported this system, the status quo of most of the people in the meat and poultry area. And so that's one of the reasons why USDA has historically gotten the bulk of the money, the bulk of the inspectors. Only in recent years have things changed where people realize that a lot of folks get sick because of other things that they're eating, uh, uh, fr uh, fruits and vegetables imported as well as do domestically grown. And we have these outbreaks of listeria and, and salmonella and E. coli and other kinds of things. And we, but the politics has been pretty much in favor of USDA, in favor of the farmers because they're the ones that are growing the product, so they have great political clout in this whole system. We were talking before about who are the, the constituency of the FDA, and you know you have some members of Congress, and I think some people in the food industry, but when it comes to the politics of this issue, the con constituency of food safety has largely been more among farmers and producers. And I think that has uh, kind of developed the, the, the regulatory system where it is right now. But, but the, when you say farmers and producers, you don't mean the farmers of spinach in California that caused a lot of disease. Was it salmonella or E. coli? Salmonella. It was salmonella. Um, oh, going back, it was E. coli. E. coli. Um, but the inspectors, the boots on the ground, are mostly at USDA, and that's for meat, that's not for produce. That's correct, and, uh, and the laws are changing to some degree, and uh, Peggy has fought very strongly to try to get some equity in the numbers of inspectors, because over the years, USDA had maybe four or five times as many inspectors as, US, as FDA did when they were at the ports and they were at the inspection points, and, they were inspecting a lot more food. And that may argue for much more structural changes in how we regulate food. But, uh, uh, but up until now, the bulk of uh, the regulatory system has been biased towards the meat and poultry area. Which had the constituents. And so what was your 
is the FDA's purview in inspecting food and ensuring food safety? Well, I think just to step back a little bit, um, you know, it is true that the FDA actually emerged in law and in organization as part of the Department of Agriculture, and then it, it became its own entity with obviously a broader mission. Um, and there is a difference in FDA's orientation in terms of, you know, we really are focused on, on public health. Um, and while USDA is as well, USDA has a mission also to support um, the advancement of agriculture, and we don't have that relationship in the same way. We, in addition, have very different legal regulatory frameworks at this point in time, where I believe that uh, slaughterhouses, for example, can't operate unless there's a USDA inspector present, whereas FDA, um, partly because of the law and partly because of resources, um, we do inspections on a periodic basis, and there are many facilities that haven't been inspected you know, for years at a time if there aren't problems that require us to go in. So it's, it's, it's a very, as you were saying, different level of, um, of oversight. And now, as we recognize that there is more that can and should be done to improve food safety in this country, and that we really are at a point in time when we need to reflect both modern advances in science and the understanding of outbreaks and risks, we, we need to really transform our food safety system. And we're actually in the midst of that at FDA with the passage, with bipartisan support in Congress and support from both industry and consumer groups, as well as the medical community, the Food Safety Modernization Act passed now, um, I guess, was it 2011? Um, and FDA has been very actively putting together the framework for implementing that. And what's important about that that I just want to mention is it's the first time that our approach to food safety has focused on prevention. And that makes absolute sense. That should be the central orienting principle. It certainly is the fundamental principle of public health. But that isn't the way our food safety system has operated for decades now. It's been um, you wait until there's a problem, and then you try to respond as quickly as possible to this problem to both um, uh, limit ongoing spread and, and, um, and make sure that the source of the problem, the manufacturer of that food or the farm or whatever, um, changes the system so that the problem won't persist. What we're trying to do now is make sure that systems are in place ahead of the um, challenge of an outbreak that actually reflect what we know about where are the risks in the continuum from farm to fork, so to speak, uh, for contamination to occur, and how can those points of vulnerability be shored up so that problems can be prevented. And it's a shared responsibility of industry growers, food producers, to develop their plans, identify um, the points of risk, and reduce them, and then government to provide both assistance in that process and ongoing oversight. So that's a key element of um, the Food Safety Modernization Act. Also the fact that food safety, and Dan mentioned this before, is really a partnership. Partnership with industry, of course, partnership amongst federal agencies, and partnership with state and local um, government uh, as well. And the Food Safety Modernization Act actually includes a lot of emphasis on building out those partnerships to leverage limited resources and, and really expand accountability at every level along the way. And then the Food Safety Modernization Act has been very important in recognizing the challenge of globalization and giving FDA new authorities um, for our work on a global basis. I, I was just going to mention, in the old days, industry uh, largely fought, or in many respects fought, government regulation in this area. But anymore, if there's an outbreak, remember the jack-in-the-box outbreak where several people died because of E. coli, or if there were an in outbreak... In a way, the, the history of modern food safety begins with jack-in-the-box. So much follows from that and, and, outbreak uh, and those and, deaths. And uh, so imagine if there was an outbreak affecting McDonald's or a major food supplier. It, it could be destructive. It could destroy the reputation of the company. We just had this wisteria outbreak involving Bluebell ice cream. Some of you may recall that. 
killed two or three people. Actually, and recall is the operative word. And pardon? Recall is the operative yes, word. Yes, yes, recall. Uh, but in any event, so, so now what you find more than you ever found before is, because of modern social media and the public's intervention in these areas, that industry is actually becoming more of a partner in this effort than they ever were before. Because if you have a problem and somebody dies, they're gone. They're, you, people stop buying their products. And so that makes at least the regulator side of the picture a little bit easier than it used to be. Yeah. And one thing about regulation, if done right, it really both can help improve the product in terms of quality and identifying you know, the points of vulnerability, as I was mentioning, et cetera. But it can also level the playing field for industry so that if there are bad actors who are willing to put a bad product into the marketplace and then undermine confidence not just in their product, but in, in anyone who's selling that type of product. You mentioned the spinach. Well, the spinach industry, when there was a, a small, relatively small outbreak at one point, suffered enormously because nobody anywhere wanted to buy any kind of spinach because they associated it with contamination. So, so there has been really a lot of support. And they for this never recovered because of that damned kale. <laughs> um, Dan, but, but these hard decisions and, and companies closing, uh, did you have to shut down any companies when you were um, agriculture secretary? And I'm going to ask Peggy if you actually had any close encounters with them. Uh, I did. Uh, I closed down a company, a supplier of hamburger meat uh, that had uh, repetitive issues involving uh, uh, s contamination, and it was very difficult because we put several hundred people out of work. It was rare. In most cases, when you company has a problem, remember at USDA, we have inspectors at every meat plant in the country, and they're looking at this product as it goes down the line. So uh, uh, they saw this happening, and the company didn't respond. And, and we didn't have, uh, we, we rarely would use mandatory recall authority, but we had something at USDA that FDA didn't have, which is, you know, there's that USDA stamp that goes on the piece of meat. And I, that's what I used to do all day in school, I guess, all day long, putting that stamp on there. But anyway, you could remove the, what's called remove the mark, remove the stamp, and then they couldn't sell the meat. And that was a, really a hammer or a club to get them to do what they were, they were supposed to do. And you hopefully could prevent it before it got to that point. And that's a hammer that the FDA did not have before the Food Safety Modernization Act, which was widely heralded for giving uh, FDA, the first mandatory recall authority. But before that, I think you might have had um, issues with companies that uh, maybe had refused to close. What did you do? Well, you know, the, the first approach is always to work with the company and get them to undertake a voluntary recall, but, and most companies do. But that doesn't always happen. And the lack of mandatory recall meant that um, uh, number one, there often would be a prolonged period when, in fact, dangerous products might be in the marketplace, trying to persuade the companies to take the appropriate action and having to shame them in the media, um, et cetera. But we always did have, and I apologize, I still say we when I talk about the FDA. Right it's only ahead. been a couple of weeks. Um, but um, you, know, you could always take a legal action working with our colleagues at Department of Justice when a, a, a problem persisted. And there certainly have been instances where that had to be done, uh, including you all may remember the um, outbreaks associated with peanut products from um, the American Those Peanut Corporation. innocuous crackers with <laughs> peanut butters in vending machines. And well, so and, and you know, it turns out that peanuts get ground up and used in a huge range of products in processed foods. So, when there is a problem, you can be stunned by the number of different uh, products that are affected and also the number of venues um, that the products may be sold in, uh, in this country and, of course, around the world. But the, the problems with American Peanut Corporation were sufficient that criminal charges were brought, and it was only just recently that the whole case wound its way through the system. Were there times that you remember thinking, gosh, if we only had mandatory recall authority? Was it something you remember wishing you had? Well, yes. And you know, I think that it is very important for its hammer um, possibility, just real, you know, knowing that 
the companies knowing we have the hammer matters, but also to be able to move quickly. And nothing was more frustrating in both on the drug and the um, food side to have identified a problem and then have to work through the, the, the courts while the, there was time urgency uh, to the problem. You know, the argument against is nobody wants anyone to take an action to um, uh, quickly if you don't have all the information, but it's the constant weighing of, of risks and process that's a challenge there. But having mandatory recall when it meets you know, the standards of public health risk is enormously important. And in addition, the Food Safety Modernization Act gave us another important authority, uh, which during my tenure I saw make a difference, where when we did inspections overseas, because we don't do as many inspections overseas, and we are doing them under a different set of legal regulatory mandates than may exist in that country, many companies did not want to let us in. And um, we really couldn't do much under those circumstances except try to persuade. Now we actually, FDA has the authority to refuse entry of a product if the company won't let us in uh, to do an inspection, even if there's no reason to assume that there's a problem with the product. If we can't get in there to do a routine inspection, we can actually uh, refuse the product. I just, I just was going to mention, what we're talking about here, and it may seem a little bit arcane, but here you have two separate, somewhat compatible regulatory systems in trying to ensure uh, safety of food products in this country that have grown up in separate trees in many respects had nothing to do with each other until recent years and people started talking with each other. And so the issue of food food, and food safety has become much bigger in most people's minds. And so uh, one of the things that is a public policy issue that we have been considering, nothing has gotten done yet, is could we reorganize this into one more central place where all food is kind of regulated in the same place rather than meat and poultry and related products and one place. The, the classic issue is pizza. Pizza has a hamburger meat on it or pepperoni on it, then it's regulated one place. And if it's cheese and not meat products, it's regulated another place. And, and you were talking about the fact that uh, meat and poultry had an important lobby that got a lot of money for inspection as opposed to FDA, which didn't have yeah. a traditional business lobby. Right. Pizza, as you all might know, has a lobby of its own. And this is, this is no joke. Unlike most foods, pizza has a very powerful trade association that really, that really works for it. It's hugely important. I was going to ask you about the number of inspectors. Uh, when you talk about the idea of one overarching food safety regulatory agency, which is really important, we've been talking about the big disparity between the number that USDA has and the number FDA has. You said very frankly, years can go by between inspections. But w what one has read a lot is criticisms of meat inspection, that, that industry has, through voluntary compliance, been allowed to run production lines too fast so that inspectors can't actually see them. Did you feel that there was a sufficient number of boots on the ground, which we know FDA has never been able to afford to have, and that, that they were able to do their job? Well, at times I felt we had too many inspectors on the ground. They, you'd be inspectors in, in the line behind the people who were cutting the meat and processing it kind of at every step of the way, rather than testing the meat at appropriate places and trying to ensure that there weren't microscopic uh, you know, uh, problems going on. So th the number of inspectors was kind of less relevant to me than to what they were doing. And then we had a lot of labor issues uh, with the inspectors because the inspectors had their own unions and there were always labor management issues between inspectors and, and uh, the companies that they were inspecting. And USDA was kind of caught in the middle. The, the, the sad part about it is, is that food inspectors ought to be a little bit more interchangeable than they are right now so that if we kind of had one agency or a central place to do it, we could move inspectors around more where they were needed. And uh, it's complicated, but the system right now is rigid and doesn't allow that to happen. And I, I just want to underscore that while inspection is very important to ensure adherence to standards and it's essential to do inspections in the context of an emerging concern so you can actually identify and examine and probe the circumstances in that facility. Food safety is not something that we should organize around 
a huge elaborate inspectional system. We need to organize it with the foundation being a sensible science-based approach to food safety that is embedded in every facility and in the practice of, of food manufacturers with oversight. And it doesn't necessarily mean you know, the old model of inspectors going in and swabbing and making sure you have the right material on the floor and all that. Some of that is important. But we're talking now about literally hundreds of thousands of facilities and facilities in, you know, well over 120 different countries. And, you know, the notion that we will ever have an inspectional system where either USDA or FDA is in those facilities really overseeing practice on a regular basis, I think is just wishful thinking. And so we better apply better standards. And I think part of it is really um, making sure we've got robust regulatory systems with clear standards and oversight, but um, you know, really having systems where industry is is held accountable and where you know consumers are are demanding certain kinds of practices. So should we have one overarching food agent food safety agency and do you think it would make us all rest easier because we about our food being safe? Well, it, you know it makes a lot of sense on its face. I mean, I think right now there, there actually are about 15 different agencies at the federal level that have some role in food safety, but we're FDA and USDA are clearly you know, the big gorillas. Um, at FDA, we used to say you know, kind of woefully that they did 20%, they were responsible for 20% of the food supply and got 80% of the money. Um, and so from the FDA perspective and looking at, you know, the sort of comprehensive approach to food uh, safety, it does make sense to look at how can we better um, share resources, expertise, and activity. And Food Safety Modernization Act is actually moving us towards yeah. that because FDA is working on farms in a way we never did before, so we're doing it in partnership with um, with USDA, but I think it's it's much more complicated than it seems on its face. You think, oh, just carve out pieces from these different agencies, put them into a new agency, give it a new name, and go forward. But it, it has to be done. Homeland Food Security. Well, uh, <laughs> that's worked very well, by the way. <laughs> but but and you have so many other players. You have states and local health departments. So they're often the ones on the front lines when there's a problem, somebody gets sick, or there's there's an issue that takes place, and they play a very key role in, in all of these issues. Uh, uh, you know, my, my judgment is, is that the system needs to be more integrated. And um, the other thing I would tell you is, is that representing farmers, farmers are, they, look, they're, they're as interested in food safety as anybody else because if their products are contaminated, it impacts uh, their ability, cantaloupe, for example, we had a cantaloupe scare, and then we, we, the reduction in purchases of cantaloupes was material because of some farmers, I think it was in eastern Colorado, and that kind of thing. And so, but farmers are very, very suspicious of the government coming in and coming in on their farms and regulating their behavior. And uh, so... I don't think anybody likes it. No, I understand that, but uh, uh, today the culprit is the EPA, where far many farmers view the EPA as the enemy. And so FDA has got to deal with this issue of how you deal with on-farm uh, issues, because a lot of these problems begin on-farm, and contamination, cross-contamination, that kind of thing. And that's why the politics are so difficult of just moving this into some big government agency, because I guarantee you that Congress will have some serious issues with that. So you both, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, there's the challenge also that, you know much more about this than I do, but American agriculture doesn't have a one-size-fits-all approach. And whether it's different products or different types of agriculture or different sizes of the enterprise, and so one has to have a, a system that's flexible yes. and reflects um, the fact that you know you 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 can't have one cookie cutter approach. And in addition, there is I, I mentioned earlier a little bit about you know the balancing of of, of risks and benefits and costs. Um, 
In an ideal world, for example, you wouldn't want any animals in the fields. But you know, you can't have a farm that doesn't have some natural vermin and fowl that are part of it. And the real know, reason is f animals will go to the bathroom wherever they want to, including on crops that you might ultimately end like up spinach. eating. Right, okay, exactly. So you know, <laughs> so, you, know really? you have to sort of put things in perspective and you have to identify what are the risks that we're really going to focus on that we can really make a difference and are there ways that, that uh, can be agreed to in the real world that need to, to so, uh, be so in, the, in, in the farmland, and don't forget the point you were going to make, but in the farmland analogy, the fox is guarding the hen house. Both of you have said very optimistic things about industry regulating. Um, and we have a piece that I'm very, very glad is in the Aspen idea that Dan wrote with um, Tom Daschle. Uh, talking about the role that industry can play in food security, we, we would be nowhere and we would not be eating without the food industry. And I'm an enormous believer in the effectiveness and the effective role that they play. And we, we cannot ignore them. We can only respect them. But they're so important in food safety. And at what point does voluntary compliance end and um, the, the sharp knife of regulation start? And has that balancing act been very effectively performed by the USDA and the FDA? I guess the best analogy I would use is the FAA. So when all of you flew here, there probably wasn't an FAA inspector on the ground when they unloaded the baggage and they refueled the airplane and the pilots did the walk around of the plane to see if the engines were leaking or the uh, or the tires were full or those or kinds of things. Or the battery was dead, as happened yeah. on my plane <laughs> yesterday. Okay. But, but on the other hand, we have inspectors that have uh, uh, the processes to review to make sure that engines are inspected on time, that pilots are properly trained, and uh, these rules are rigor rigorously followed. Uh, and, um, and by and large, we have the safest air system in the world in this country, in large part because no airline wants to have a crash, and the government's done a pretty good job of keeping that from happening. But it's not having 100,000 inspectors on the ground, being on every airplane, watching everything that's going on. I think that analogy has, by and large, worked pretty well in the area of food safety. The FDA, however, hasn't had the resources that it's needed to to uh, do it with the large enough amount of food that people actually eat. And so I think that, that we can do better. Well, and to build on the airline analogy, if I may, there actually is an international organization that oversees airline safety that, that sets certain standards for all countries, because every country has a vested interest in the safety and security of their citizens, even if they fly on a foreign airlines. So, so there's a desire to have some convergence of standards and oversight and expectations yeah. about the quality of training and maintenance and that there aren't counterfeit um, batteries and other things. And we're moving towards that actually in the regulatory world because the only way that we can be sure that what you find in your grocery store is as safe as possible when 50% of the fresh fruit is coming from other countries you know, over 85% of seafood. Um, Just, I, I was glad you mentioned that statistic because I was waiting for the surprise effect. 85% of the seafood we eat in this country from uh, yeah. imported. So we need to be able to rely on our counterpart regulatory agencies as well as industry to make sure that safety standards are met. And it's a huge, huge challenge and it's not going to get any smaller. It's only going to get more complicated. But you think that industry really can play this role? Because I have to say, I went into this panel thinking, and, and it is worth your talking about how much money the FDA does not have to implement the Food Safety Modernization Act. Because when you read especially about foreign inspections and the greatly increased regulatory powers that the FDA had in you know, not just China, which we're enjoying beating up on because it always gives us material to beat up on, um, but many other countries. I have always thought from what I've read about the Food Safety Modernization Act is that the huge obstacles, Congress won't appropriate the money to enforce it. Um, but when you say it's not really 
the number of inspectors, it's the smartness of at which points you're inspecting and what data you're using. Um, how, you know, how much more do we need and how do you feel about the current uh, appropriations for the yeah. organization? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's, it's always been a total mystery to me and, um, and I see it as a national tragedy that the amounts of money that are needed to make a difference are actually relatively small. I mean, in the 2016 budget ask for the FDA, it was, it was under 200, I mean, two, $2 million, I think, and in, in terms of, um, under 200 million. 200 million. I already have. Under figured. 2 million dollars. Um, yeah. Yes, 200 million. And, um, uh, you know, in terms of the cost to industry, the cost to healthcare, the cost to families and communities of food safety, it's, it's really nothing. I, I, I agree with her totally, but I have to add one other thing. Please. With 330 million people in this country, with billions of pounds of food being eaten every day and everything else, it's a really amazing statistic that we don't have more people dying and getting sick than we do. The main uh, bulwark against that is an effective regulatory system that's accurately, adequately funded. But, and this is somewhat controversial, I know, because I'm not putting the burden on the people, but it requires more comprehensive stuff than just the regulatory system. It requires the people themselves washing their hands and handling their product uh, and, and with good judgment. I'm not, and, and that doesn't mean that if somebody doesn't get sick with E. coli because they didn't handle it correctly, we should blame the people. But there are a lot of simple rules. Half of foodborne illnesses in this country are caused by people who don't wash their hands, both from the restaurant industry and in individual things. Now, again, that's no uh, subterfuge for not funding the FDA because you know, if you don't have the regulatory system, all the efforts in the world to get, have people cook their food thoroughly um, go for naught. But that's why the, to deal with this problem is, requires a very comprehensive look at regulation, inspection, and then how people handle, people not only at home, but in restaurants and in food purveying operations handle the operation of their food. And here we have to put in a plug for an agency we haven't mentioned, the Centers for Disease Control, because in order to investigate who hasn't washed their hands and what actually happened to cause uh, sickness and outbreaks, it's the Center for Disease Control that often fields the teams that go and try to conduct the investigations that will lead to action on the part of the USDA or or the FDA. And, you know, I think all of this underscores another point, which is in some ways, uh, by these agencies doing such good work day in and day out, in fact, we sort of undermine our own arguments because the public and policy makers say, well, why do you need all this money? You know, we've got one of the safest food supplies in the world, yet we are always operating on the verge of a disaster if we do not invest in the systems that are necessary, if we do not take this opportunity to really transform how we do food safety in this country with the focus on prevention and a recognition that the world has changed so enormously since the time that many of our uh, ways of doing business first went into place. And if industry doesn't realize that they have a huge investment in terms of brand and public trust and their own uh, economic robustness in being full partners with the regulator and with consumers to get the job done and every single day be thinking about what needs to be done to keep the food supply as safe as possible. Um, I can't resist, we're about to open it for questions, so I hope you're saving up good questions. Um, but. Part of Food Safety Modernization Act was, was label changing. Uh, and, and I wondered if you had thoughts about um, changes you'd like to see in the way food is labeled and the information that's presented on the package, uh, which has been much under discussion and is still kind of a hot topic. Well, the main um, labeling issues are outside the Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, in terms of the updating of the nutrition facts label, which many of you um, may be aware of, the what we call the iconic uh, image on processed foods, the black and white that, that describe the different components of the food. And because 
we know a lot more about nutrition science and health, and because we know a lot more also about eating habits of the American public, um, it really needs to be updated. And the FDA um, fairly recently put forward a proposal uh, to make some, some important modifications that I think can make um, a real difference for health. There also are labeling um, discussions going on that probably many of you are aware of about um, what should, uh, whether um, genetically modified or genetically engineered um, uh, products or products that have, have components that, that have that genetic engineering, should those be labeled? That's you know, currently a topic of discussion at the state level and at the federal level. Uh, there also has been a huge advance in labeling around um, certain very important aspects of food safety and health, such as allergens and gluten-free, and FDA has taken some important actions in recent years in that arena so that consumers um, can better protect their own health and that of, of their family. So there's a lot of different discussions going on around food labeling. And, and Dan wanted to remind us of the current hot topic in Washington that has to do with the nation's health entirely, which are dietary guidelines. Yeah, so what, one of the things the government does that impacts people more than anything else are these dietary guidelines that are put out every five years that kind of give you advice about, you know, what's the top, what's the, you should eat less sugar, more fresh fruits and vegetables, and in the middle is where the fights are. Where does meat come in? And uh, well, I think you know, there are fights at almost every part yeah, of it. That's right. And then the first, we used to have what's called the food guy pyramid, and then that the first lady changed that to my plate. Uh, and I, st uh, you know, I still like the pyramid better than the plate, but I'm not the wife of the president of the United States, so I didn't have any authority. There. <laughs> well, but, you know, take but, that. But but uh, that's done between the departments we represented here, and that's extremely effective in giving people advice, generally families, about how best to allocate their food intake to improve their health. Um, are you in favor of the current uh, recommendations, like this very innocent word, sustainability? I, I think- in a sustainable fashion, know, I, which you might know has caused an enormous amount of agita uh, among farmers and, and the food industry. What you know, does it mean? I, my, my theory is the dietary guidelines ought to give you information about your health. And people can talk about whether it's produced sustainably or a green technology or GMOs or no GMOs, other things that they want to. But, you know, you can make these guidelines so complicated that they mean nothing to people. So, you know, sugar, sodium, uh, fats, the kinds of things that directly impact uh, the person's ability to survive and have good health, I think that ought to be the heart of the guidelines. And the other things, while important, shouldn't confuse the, that. That's my view. So we should all keep an eye on that, because it's something that's good. It's a story that's going to keep going. It's, it's a very hot debate now. Uh, I do invite questions. Uh, do we have mics in the back and people who will be running mics? Yes, we, ha we do. And uh, the gentleman there, and of course, I'll invite. We all have strong opinions on food, so I'll invite it's tempting for everyone. I'll invite questions to direct it to panelists. Yeah, when I was a kid, a strawberry was the size of a quarter, and today a half dollar could use the same analogy for a cucumber or a pepper or chicken or cows or beef. What long-term food health or food safety issues do you have that we may not yet or should be concerned about due to genetic engineering of food, fruits, vegetables, and meats? Well. I'm sorry, but uh, you know your your question to me raises a number of issues, and actually genetic engineering isn't first amongst them because the the strawberries aren't getting bigger because of genetic engineering, in in um, except in the very traditional sense of agriculture growing things, and selecting plants um, towards a goal and consumer preference for the bigger strawberries. Which before there was the name genetic engineering was genetic engineering. <laughs> was genetic, agriculture. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hybridization. Um, but, um, but you know, generally when people are talking about, I mean, that's genetic modification. Genetic engineering really speaks to when you insert something into the plant itself that wouldn't normally be there into the, the germline, so to speak, to, um, to change, you know, something uh, that would be not a manipulation that could occur in the, the field um, with the way that, you know, a nectarine actually is produced through manipulation. 
But anyway, one of the things that I think is really important, and it merges more into a discussion that I think Dan is going to be having later in Spotlight Health about food security and the adequacy of the food supply. But you know, one thing that happens is that those strawberries that are smaller may just get thrown out because the consumer preferences for the bigger strawberry. And in our modern world, when people are going hungry, you know, that to me is the thing that worries me the most about you know, the trend that you were describing. And Dan, do you have concerns? Well, I, I, I'm much more concerned about excessive use of pesticides and chemicals than I am about the GMO issue. Because well, if, you, if you can use GMOs as a way to produce crops that use less pesticides and chemicals, that's a great trade-off as far as I'm concerned. Now, I don't know if the companies have done a very good job so far of developing that. I'm more concerned about excessive use of water. Our aquifers are falling down to nothing. 70% of the water that's used in the world is used for agriculture, 70%. 30% is for everything else. I, if we can use modern technology and new engineering techniques to grow plants that use less water, that's a, a, a great asset. I mean, I, I'm not unmindful of the public concern about GMOs, but by and large, I think there are far more serious public health threats out there, even in the area of agriculture, than the issue of GMOs. But your point about how we in order to achieve certain goals in terms of the end product, actually introduce risks that we don't necessarily have we, to we have may, is yeah, very yeah. important. Yeah. The gentleman in white in the back of the room and then the woman in yellow. I have a, uh, a very specific FDA question. I think if you ask the man in the street or, or the man or woman in this room about the FDA and what their prime mission is, I think that it might wind up being attributed to approval of new drugs, to the recall of drugs, to approval of diagnostic and products and devices. So I'm very curious as to what proportion of your resources are devoted to the food side and what proportion of the resources, whether it's by budget or by headcount or however you do it, are devoted to the pharmaceutical uh, and device uh, side. Well, the responsibilities of FDA are extraordinarily broad and actually go way beyond just food, drugs, and devices. Um, and actually, FDA regulated products account for more than 20 cents of every dollar that consumers spend in this country. Um, but, but in terms of the FDA budget, it is not um, a shared um, uh, budget where it's equally distributed by any means, the drug and device side, particularly the drug side. Devices, I would say, are, are quite significantly underfunded. The drug side um, is, is much more um, richly supported. And that's in, in significant part because industry actually provides what are called user fees. Um, and, and so the budget is enhanced by um, monies that come from uh, the regulated industry, and there's an elaborate process where um, the amount that they'll pay is negotiated, and um, Congress gets involved, uh, and there's all kinds of firewalls to make sure that you know there's no, you know, perception or reality of, of the companies paying for their products to go through the system in a one-to-one -one way. But it, it has made a huge difference in terms of being able to give more depth on the bench. Um, in terms of, of resources, uh, human, and other important resources to uh, undertake those activities. On the food side, there isn't that kind of augmentation of the budget, and it was actually discussed in the Food Safety Modernization Act, but ultimately uh, Congress removed any user fees uh, from the budget. Was it because food producers were less motivated than pharmaceutical companies? I think it's if you don't need to pay, you don't want to pay. I think that if you look at the experience with uh, the, the drug side of the house, industry has benefited enormously from mm -hmm. having user fees. And they saw huge backlogs and prolonged review times um, you know, really shrink. They saw that they were able to have much more interaction with the review teams to get their questions answered because there were more people. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think now the pharmaceutical industry is very supportive of user fees, and it's sort of just part of the way uh, 
business is done. On the food side, I think industry would actually come to see it as an asset, and there are companies that see it that way too, but it hasn't been the norm, and so there hasn't been a rush to get out the checkbooks uh, to change the system. I just wanted, the, your question's interesting though. You know, there was this French philosopher who over 150 years ago said, you are what you eat. Riyad Savarin, okay. as you yeah, all know. That's right, okay. He said it a lot more eloquently than I did. Uh, I think the interesting point here is, is that as we look at pharmaceuticals and we look at all the other regulatory type of issues, we give very short shrift in this country to the relationship between food and health. And yet it is probably, other than exercise and genes, the most significant determiner about how long you're going to live and how healthy you're going to be. So uh, I'm not arguing for anything here, because I want you to have all the resources that you have. Just, just as a matter of public policy, I like people to think about that, because most people don't, unfortunately. There are probably few things that um, poll better than the public's interest in food safety. Yes. You know, I mean, it is something that you'd think politicians could really get their arms around, too. It's true. Um, the, the woman in yellow? Well, this is uh, wonderful because it's sort of segued right to what my concern and questions are is we have so much um, emphasis on this fear and loathing of the GMO. And really, when it comes down to food and nutrition, how do we get the best food and nutrition basically starts with soil health. The soil is a living microbe, microbiome. And so if you could speak some to, to covering sort of bringing these previous two questions and, and a little bit more about you are what you eat. Uh, in the last Farm Bill, the Congress actually added $200 million, about as much as you're looking for, for a foundation of, called the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research to look into new techniques to improve the production of food that are not being replicated by the private sector or by the government. One of those is soil health because it's been basically un... I mean, there are a lot of people looking at the living nature of the soil and, and how you can continue to have a soil that will produce fertile crops in some parts of the world and how others you don't, the role of fertilizer. And for, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, a limited amount of fertilizer would increase yields rather dramatically. At the same time, we don't not totally sure what that means over the long term, but, but we do know that soil health is a great determiner of the ability to feed the world, feed nine to nine and a half billion people in the world, especially with climate changes. So the question's a good question, and uh, there, this needs to be the topic of a lot more research than we're currently doing. It also relates to food safety issue because bacteria live in the soil, and that can produce problems in certain cases, especially when there's runoff, fertilizer runoff, that kind of thing. So that is unfortunately the last question we were able to take. It was um, a great and important note to end on. And I want to thank all of you and our panelists because understanding how food safety happens, how it's regulated, is so much more complicated than we know or wish it to be. And to have the people who have been right inside doing it has been a huge privilege and treat for me to get to hear. And thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. And the two of you for